Hello and most welcome to Heidegger 1659 of the series. And we will today start a new brand new artic article by Sadwan Lee of San Francisco, California. Jesus, the holder of the seven stars in his right hand. An examination of Revelation 1 16 in light of numismatic evidence. In Revelations abstract, in Revelation 116a, Jesus is portrayed as holding the seven stars in his right hand. The immediate context interprets this imagery. As Jesus's exercising his sovereignty over the seven angels of the seven churches. This article suggests that a secondary interpretation is possible in light of numismatic evidence and the larger context of revelation. According to this reading, the depiction of Jesus in Revelation 116a functions as a literary device that subverts the message embedded in Dios Caesar coin types. a message that promotes the imperial power. Uh, by portraying Jesus as the holder of the seven stars in his right hand, the author of Revelation places Jesus far above the imperial power, claiming that Jesus is the ruler par excellence. Whose sovereignty extends to both the terrestrial and celestial realms. One introduction Revelation one sixteen A contains an image of Jesus is holding the seven stars in his right hand. Commenting on this image, Re 
Robin J. Whittaker correctly avers the interpretation offered within the text is very specific. That is the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. According to this reading, the portrait of Jesus in Revelation 116a indicates the sovereignty of Jesus over the seven angels of the churches. While this interpretation is justified by the immediate context of revelation, we can make the text a bit 200%. Yes, that works well. Some scholars go further in scrutinizing the symbolism depicted in Revelation 116a. Among many approaches, one viable method is to take into account Greco-Roman numismatic evidence. Advocates of this method often suggest that the depiction of Jesus as the holder of the seven stars should be understood in comparison with the Dios Caesar coins, coin types here of the DCCT coins that the Emperor Domitian issued in. 82 to 83 common era to consecrate his deceased son according to this reading revelation 116a is a literally literary device that polemically subverts the message embedded on the reverse side of the DCCT. A message that promotes the imperial power the purpose of this article is to further develop the numismatic approach to Revelation 116a in order to grapple <coughs> with how the depiction of Jesus as the holder of the seven stars in his right hand functions in a larger context of revelation
I will argue that by portraying Jesus as such, John places Jesus far above the imperial power, claiming that Jesus is the ruler par excellence, whose sovereignty extends to both the terrestrial and celestial realms. In doing so, John urges the Christians in Asia Minor to abandon their participation in the Roman economic system that is embedded in the imperial cults and encourage this, encourages them to endure the accompanying social and economic pressure even unto death. In order to advance this argument, I will first interpret the inscription and iconogra iconography on the reverse of the PCC. T. Thereby providing the imperial message embedded in these coins. Then I will compare the imperial message to Revelation 116a and its related passages in the larger context of the revelation of Revelation. This comparison will show that there is a, there are noticeable similarities and dissimilarities between the son of Domitian depicted in BCCT and Jesus described in Revelation. Third, I will establish the historical setting of Revelation, attempting to understand how the intended audience would have perceived the identification of Jesus as the holder of the seven stars in his right hand. Finally, I will conclude that understanding Revelation 116a in the light of numismatic evidence and the larger context of Revelation serves as a fruitful approach for understanding the symbolic meaning 
of Jesus as being the holder of the seven stars in his right hand. Two, interpretation of the inscription and the iconography of the reverse of the coin. In 82 to 83, common era, Domitian issued new types of gold and silver coins honoring his deified family members, Vespasian, Titus, Domitilla, Julia, Domitia and Flavius Caesar. What is of particular interest? No, what is of particular interest to this study is that one of the themes that Domitian chose for the reverse side of his coins is a naked infant. Domitian's deceased son, Flavius Caesar, seated on a globe surrounded by seven stars with the Latin inscription, Pius Caesar Imperatoro, Imperatori Domini, Dominiciani, Filius. In what follows, I will engage the inscription and the iconography of the coins. one inscription the legend on the reverse of the coin reads Deus Caesar Imperial Domitiano F Simon Price points out that the title Deus was bestowed on the recipient of the imperial cult since the establishment of the official cult of Julius Caesar. Concerning the imperial usage of Deus, Price provides the following remark. The term Divus was originally, originally not sharply distinguished from Deus, God, but from the consecration of Caesar onwards, it was used almost exclusively of properly consecrated members of the imperial family.
this is not to say that Pirus and Rius were two exclusive categories. Rather, Divus was a subcategory of Pirus, and it was thus perfectly possible to refer to a consecrated emperor as Deus. Hence, the ascription in the VCCT indicates that the deification of a deceased imperial member, the son of Domitian, took place at some point. As some scholars point out, Domitian's use of Deus on the coins he minted conveys the message that Domitian himself was also a living deity. Jean-Luc Tessier aptly remarks, his son being a deity, Domitian could not fail to be a deity. Ernest P. Janssen stresses that such an attitude of Domitian, the consecration of a son while the emperor was still alive, was a radical departure from what had been practiced by the previous Roman emperors. Janssen further explains that Roman emperors and their family members were routinely consecrated after they died. But Domitian's Deus Caesar issues eclipsed those previous claims with divine status in the present. Understanding the function of imperial cults in the Greco-Roman world is helpful in shedding light on Domitian's elevation of imperial cults. After the groundbreaking work of Price, many scholars view that imperial cults had two interconnected dimensions, political and religious.
As for the religious aspect, an emperor worships function within the larger polytheistic system of the Greek or Roman world. In other words, as Stephen J. Friesen demonstrates, imperial cults did not compose their own independent and mythic worldview. Rather, they were a distinguishable part of their broad polytheistic cultural context. However, the influence of imperial cults were not confined to a small part of religious area areas in the Roman Empire, but was all perme permeating in other words of Laszlo Gallus nothing was left untouched because they were deeply connected with public religion, entertainment, commerce, governance, architecture, household worship, and other aspects of everyday public and private life. This was possible because the political and religious aspects of Greco-Roman world were tightly interwoven. I think I'm going to do a preemptive stop here because it changes radically after this with the iconography. I'll go back and look at some quotes. One first thing to note here is on the first page in the abstract, it's a hint, I would say. Jesus is the ruler par excellence whose sovereignty extends to both the terrestrial and the celestial realms. The last sentence in that abstract both at the same time, not excluding one because of the other. Look later on the coin. And that is page 344. We can only see the tail part, not the head part. 
that the tail part and the head part of the aureus is one and the same thing and nothing could be better than having a direct coin that would be nice but seeing those two sides are simultaneously the same and also as we mentioned earlier here is the deceased son of Domitian the reproduction so to speak the copy of him and he's given the divus title but since the father must thereby also have the deification it's a reciprocal hereditary movement goes both ways This intermingledness and two-sidedness, I think it's typical for everything that is specific. Also, Deus and Divus are of the same origin. Another example of interconnectedness, the last paragraph on page 346. Go down to the very last paragraph, starting with however. However, the influence of imperial cults when was not confined to a small part of religious areas in the Roman Empire, but was all permeating. In the words of Laszlo Gallus, nothing was left untouched because they were deeply connected with public religion, entertainment, commerce, governance, architecture, household worship and other aspects of everyday public life, public and private life. Next page, Telepus. This was possible because the political and religious aspects of the Greco-Roman world were tightly interwoven. Once more, we have a double sided. It reminds me about the situation in India where it's impossible to tell religion from everyday life. It's the idea we have, and I would say it's quite modern. The idea that religion is something separable from the rest, and that there are specific religious activities. In a way, they are all the same. They could be chores, as mentioned here, architecture, governance, household worship. I would say in India, it's very clear what you do in the household, deeply connected. And by being deeply connected, they can also be discernible. This is one of the reasons we can have religion. It is not connected to everything else. I almost come to think here of the Calo Rovelli relational 
quantum physics, everything is related. And if it's not interconnected, it, it loses its power to be singular, loses its power to be something having identity as such. This will later be reinforced in the text when it comes to iconography. I will not go into that now, it's rather complex so far, but the interconnectedness also in iconography is quite massive. And I think the modern take is to be exclusive, do only one thing, only religion. That one-eyed, one-eyedness is the same, I would say, as monosemism. Once upon a time, all subjects came into the picture. One-sidedness is a new thing. And it makes even the side you want to press on disappear because if you take away one side of the coin, take away head, you will neither have tail. And the same goes for a text, take away the verso and you also lose the rectum. Interconnectedness, broadness is the absolute sine qua non for having exactness and definitiveness. Without that, we lose the ability to be specific. This is the same contradictory situation that Jacob and Kangelham couldn't manage. Therefore, they could not withstand having things being both metaphor and concept. It needs to be either or, which leads to nullification, as in the words of Rodolphe Cachet. I strongly recommend that. Maybe some comments from my dear colleague, Kalle. Thank you. Do you hear me? So let's let me comment on this coin from 82-83, which is at British Museum. In the book of Revelation, Jesus has seven stars in his hand. How many stars do we have here? Do you hear me clearly, Hans? I count seven. Yes, yes. so one, three, four, five, six, seven, indeed. And then we could say that there is two additional stars. Yes. yes, like we could call them hand stars. <laughs> uh, the hands mm -hmm. uh, look like stars, or vice versa. So in total, you have uh, perhaps nine stars. So this is a little bit different. Uh, so while the correlation is seven uh, stars in his hand, here the stars are outside, but also two hands, stars are actually hands. And this is also uh, a sign of uh, inter, uh, of, of things being interwoven. Well, what are interwoven? Namely, hands and stars, they say the same thing. And, and uh, so, uh, and these stars, Probably, I don't know, uh, there are not only stars that you have in heavens, but perhaps also those stars that you find in the sea, like in Florida. <laughs> um, I don't know how safe you have seen these stars that you find in, um, in water, so I have seen them in Florida. I don't remember the correct name for them, but they look like this. Hans, have you seen them? <clears throat> come, come again, Kalle, you were breaking up there for a while, please. Stars that you see not only in heavens, but stars that you have in uh, the sea. In Florida. Stars you have in the sea? Yes, sea stars. Have you seen them? Of course, yeah, yeah. 
Yes, 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 I've seen that. So probably they are they both, uh, both see stars and uh, nice stars at the same time. Very good, yeah. Yeah, I do agree. So this will be dominion on both of the sea and the sky. Indeed, celestial and terrestrial. Very good. Mm -hmm. So I love this image. Uh, I wonder if John had one coin when he wrote down uh, the book of Revelation. It looks very suggestive indeed. So uh, perhaps we should stop there, Hans, for this time. Yes, if you like. Yeah, sure. Uh... And once more, we come to an understanding of the interwovenness and the uh, monoscopic view of modern man is quite a new thing. And I was just something that came up in the back of my head was the left hemisphere, that the left hemisphere wants to exclude everything else, just focus on one thing, and thereby, uh, in the words, I think it was, Ian McKilkus that mentioned that you would lose both uh, going the other way and making uh, holiness general as happened, uh, for instance, during the British Reformation. And I said, every place is holy. Holiness disappeared. Without contradiction, you have nothing left. There's neither head nor tail. So I say thank you very much. I will now stop the recording. Thank you for listening in and have a very pleasant day, afternoon, night, whatever you have. Thank Bye. you.